Okay, so um, <clears throat> it is not only a pleasure but a honor to be here and uh, speak at this celebration of the continuation of the research work of Ricardo. Um, I've, uh, I was teaching here a few years ago and I had the opportunity to talk a lot with him about uh, astrophysics and uh, what astrophysics and cosmic ray physics can tell us about uh, new physics, whatever that means, in a very generalized form. And uh, I was always impressed by the depth of the questions that he was asking. And it's always a pleasure for me to talk with somebody that doesn't have any problem sending me to hell if I say something that doesn't make any sense. And so I guess I'm here to um, discuss about this, this um, uh, topic, anomalies in cosmic rays, and what we can learn in terms of new physics, because Ricardo has always had a very open mind in terms of uh, what we can learn from any direction in terms of physics. So, historically, it should be sort of clear that cosmic ray has a strong connection with quote unquote new physics. Uh, we should never forget that the positron, pi ions, and many uh, hyperons were initially discovered in cosmic rays. Now, later on, of course, there was, a, there was the age of the accelerators, the situation has changed, and uh, cosmic rays, yes, can tell us about physics, but the luminosity of our accelerator in cosmic rays is so low compared with LHC or stuff like that, that the chances have much reduced in terms of um, uh, exploring physics in the showers, for instance. But it remains true that we have a, a, a plethora, we have a, a bunch of phenomena in the universe that are sort of extreme in many, case, many senses that I will try to explain and can uh, provide a, a, a chance for us to learn about new physics or to put limits on the new physics, not necessarily to discover it. So, unfortunately or fortunately, the claims for new physics in cosmic rays abound, which is not necessarily a good thing because some of them are not very well grounded. So, some of these are listed here, only some of these, and only the one in white I will try to cover in this talk. So, of course, positron access has attracted a lot of attention in the last two or three years, and it's worthwhile to uh, discuss what is going on in that direction. But there are lots of anomalies in terms of gamma ray propagation over cosmological distances, and very recently, there are some avenues, uh, again, connected with gamma ray astronomy that might allow us to actually measure the cosmological magnetic fields. In all these instances, I will try to um, keep a very critical attitude. When you try to measure these things, you have to realize that we live in a complicated universe in which a lot of astrophysics is going on at the same time. So if you want to understand physics, well, it may be unpleasant, but tough. I mean, that's, you know, there is a lot of complicated stuff that you have to uh, take into account. So let's start from the posture and access that probably all of you has learned, has uh, ever heard about. So this is the ratio of the fluxes of positrons to the sum of electrons and positrons as measured as a function of energy uh, from three different experiments. Uh, we have in uh, red the AMS2 experiment. There are blue points here from Pomela. There is this uh, greenish sort of band from uh, Fermilat. Now the thing that you should, that you are supposed to be impressed by is the fact that this ratio rises with energy above 10 GeV or so. And I will explain in a few slides why this is surprising. But that's what people talk about when they refer to uh, posture and excess. So the posture and fraction should go down like this and instead at some point starts going up. Now, we often talk about uh, new physics in cosmic rays. The reason, I guess, is obvious. I mean, if you look at the scale there, we are around 100 GV, 10, uh, uh, 1,000 GV. So scales that resemble sort of where we were expecting supersymmetry to kick in. Um, same is true for ultra-energy cosmic rays. In the center of mass of a shower induced by ultra-energy cosmic ray, Cosmic rays, the, the energy is of the level of uh, 10 to 100 TV or so. So the hope is that if you explore these phenomena, you can learn something on particle physics there. Okay, so <clears throat> not only the positron fraction has been measured, but separately the fluxes of electrons and positrons. So this is the spectrum of electrons plus positrons, and you see that roughly speaking, it's something flat in. Uh, multiplied by E cubed, so roughly it's E to minus three. 
um, power law here. But what you see in the positrons is that with a high statistical significance, at some point around 30, 50 GB or so, in Pamela and in AMS, there is something new kicking in. So the positron spectrum, not only the ratio, goes up. That's very important. The ratio can go up also because the denominator is going down, right? But this, the measurement of the positron flux shows that, in fact, what is rising is the positron flux. Interestingly, in the antiprotons, absolutely nothing weird is going on. So the flux of antiprotons is exactly as we were expecting it to be based on cosmic ray propagation models. And that imposes, of course, a lot of constraints. So excess, excess with respect to what, of course? Uh, so the only guaranteed source, really, of positrons that we have in our galaxy is secondary flux from proton-proton collisions producing pi plus, okay? So that is the main source. That is the only guaranteed source of positrons. And we know how to calculate that. The spectrum of cosmic rays is related to whatever the spectrum of the sources is. Let's say that E2 minus gamma is the spectrum at the injection. It's related, what we see at the Earth is related to the spectrum that we see at the Earth simply by this additional delta, which uh, parameterizes the energy dependence of the diffusion coefficient in the galaxy. For, this is for protons. For electrons, there is the additional complication that you have radi radiative losses, especially uh, inverse Compton scattering in the galaxy and synchron radiation. So you can easily derive the slope of the um, electron spectrum, which again is the injection, minus one half, minus delta half, and the delta here is the same delta that appeared above, okay? Now, <clears throat> the positrons in the galaxy, the secondary positrons, are generated because cosmic rays impact on the interstellar medium and eventually produce pi plus. The cross-section is almost energy independent, so it's, it's easy to derive that the spectrum of the produced pairs is exactly the same as the spectrum of the parent cosmic rays, okay? So the slope at the injection is exactly the same. But what we see at the Earth is, again, the result of equilibration with losses. So you can now calculate whatever you are expecting to see at the Earth, and you get, again, you have the factor one half that I explained above and the factor delta. So you now can calculate the ratio, and the ratio is e to minus delta. Delta we measure from boron over carbon. We know it's positive, therefore, the expectation is that the posturum fraction should decrease monotonically with energy. The fact that it increases with energy, of course, raised a lot of questions. And the fact that the energy scale where this happened, sort of interesting, it's in the TV range, uh, raised some doubt that maybe what we are seeing is manifestation of new physics. So the first candidate was dark matter annihilation or decay, but there are other things to deal with. For instance, positrons are produced as a result of radioactive decays in uh, supernova remnants, uh, supernova explosions. Uh, positrons are produced as secondaries inside sources and eventually get accelerated. And uh, even more, we have perfect positron machines, electron positron machines in the galaxy, uh, pulsar winds, and I will try to explain why this is a, uh, a very important thing to keep in mind. So, <clears throat> The dark matter hypothesis is, of course, comes in a million flavors, and it's very hard to explain all the different models that have been developed, and it's not the purpose of this talk. So I will stick with uh, the basic points. The idea is that you may have, a, for instance, a neutralino, but not necessarily some sort of dark matter candidate that through annihilation gives a quark anti-quark, which eventually hydronizes and produces uh, uh, pi zeros. Okay, but also uh, pi, pi plus and pi minus. So, in principle, the pi zero would give you a signal in gamma rays, and the charged pi ends would give you a signal in the leptons. So that's the basic um, idea. Now, the, the spectrum of these uh, um, additional leptons would naturally cut at an energy scale which is roughly the mass of this particle. So, say in the TeV or 100 GeV or something like that. And of course, it has to cut off at least at that energy because the excess extends to about 100 GeV or so, okay? Now, the point is that once you put the numbers in, the cross-section for your uh, dark matter candidate for annihilation must be in the range between 10 to minus 24 and 10 to minus 22 centimeter cubed per second. Now, this is 
very large compared with the so-called cosmological thermal relics, which is more in the range of 10 to minus 26, 10 to minus 27 centimeter cubed per second. So clearly something else is going on there. So people at first were, well, discouraged is not the right word because the reaction was very quick. And uh, the reaction was to say that, uh, well, by the way, the rate of annihilation goes like one over the mass of the particle squared. So the larger the mass, the, short, the smaller the signal. Therefore, to recover the positron in excess, you need to increase the cross-section even more, right? So the large cross-section, for instance, people said, well, it could be absorbed in a sort of boost factor of astrophysical origin. What people mean, mean by that is that the signal of annihilation goes like density squared, and the, the density of dark matter is uh, usually cusped. And if you have substructure and the distribution of dark matter, in, additional, in addition to the annihilation in uh, usual galaxy halos, for instance, you may have annihilation in smaller clumps. And the result at that point will depend on uh, the minimum mass in the clumps that form in the galaxy. Usually from uh, large scale structure simulation, you get the boost factor, this uh, magical number, which is of order a few, at the most 10, and you need much more than that. So people said, well, maybe we need some additional particle physics effect. For instance, some sort of Sommerfeld enhancement in a cross section of annihilation. So these were different uh, proposals trying to fit the dark matter uh, onto reality, onto nature. It's not required by nature. It's an attempt that people were making. Now, even assuming, however, that all these factors conspire to give the right number to, to explain what uh, we are observing, there still is a big problem, namely that adronization gives you a lot of hadrons. And uh, this adronic signal with such large cross-sections would give you a, a, a signal in protons or in gamma rays, especially in gamma rays, which is large. Sorry. Uh, which is large and unobserved. Therefore, the additional assumption, and at this point things got really shaky for me and I decided that this was not physical anymore, is that this dark matter had to be some, uh, in a way, leptophilic or hydrophobic. So it shouldn't produce um, hadrons, it should couple mainly to leptons. Now, uh, at this point, you know, you give up the assumption that WIMPs may be thermal. You have to assume that they are non-thermal. You have to give up most of what we know about supersymmetry. And I guess the, the, the price to pay at that point is way too large to accept it. So uh, I guess one has two choices. Either keep making the model more and more complicated, which is not appealing to me at least, or uh, accept that maybe we can just use this to put up the limits on the cross sections. And so saying that the signal is of astrophysical origin, maybe we can just use this to put limits on the annihilation cross-section. So you can do that, and people have spent some time doing that. Again, we're talking about upper limits on cross-sections of dark matter, which is kind of weird. I mean, it's coupled only to leptons and not to hadrons and so on. So it's not the standard thermal, uh, thermal relic that uh, we uh, love because of the CDM miracle. So at this point, of course, one has to understand this axis in other ways, and this is where complexity kicks in. So we know that positrons are produced, for instance, in radioactive decays. They are produced in a bunch of other ways, but I will try to concentrate on the last one because it's really what I would consider the uh, prototypical, uh, prototypical ideal machine of electron positron production. Now, when a core collapse supernova explodes, usually leaves behind a rotating neutron star. And it's uh, pretty magnetized with surface magnetic fields of the order of 10 to 12, 10 to 13 gauss or so, okay? And the rotation is such that the star makes about 100, say, 100 rotations per second around its axis. Now, these are pretty extreme conditions which are important for this reason. When you have a magnetic field rotating at that speed, the electric field induced by the rotation exceeds by orders of magnitude the gravitational field, gravitational force. And what happens is that electrons can get stripped very easily from the surface of the star. Now the electron finds itself 
in a place where the field is of order 10 to 12 Gauss or so, the curvature radiation, even if it's tiny, produces a photon. And the photon is above threshold for pair production. So two, now you have for each electron an electron pair, an electron positron pair which is created. And both of them are again radiating photons through curvature radiation. This process is repeated in the magnetosphere of a pulsar between 10,000 and a million times, roughly. Okay? So for each electron, you roughly produce a million couple, uh, pairs of electrons and positrons. Uh, the process keeps going uh, according with the magnetic dipole. So the, the, the spin down of the pulsar slows down because of this release of, of energy in the form of electrons and positrons. Now, you can actually calculate at least for a simple approach to the problem, namely introducing a so-called breaking index, which is telling you how quickly the star spins, <coughs> spins down. You can calculate the spin down luminosity of the pulsar and eventually calculate also the age, or what I should call the characteristic time of the spin down of the pulsar and a bunch of other uh, quantities which are of interest. Now, one thing that you have to realize, again, this is the end result of a core collapse supernova. So you have uh, ejecta, about a solar mass or so, that are moving at 10,000 kilometers per second outwards and very quickly uh, fills a large volume. And in here in the center, there is this pending star that is polluting the environment with millions of electron positron pairs. The electron positron pairs have such a pressure that they in fact induce a relativistic wind that is moving with a Lorentz factor which is of order 10 to 4, 10 to 5, okay? These are indeed the most relativistic bulk flows that we know about. And uh, what happens is that the whole system becomes kind of complicated. You have a so-called forward shock where the blast wave impacts on the uh, interstellar medium. The shocked material is accumulated behind the star. At the same point, the explosion sends backward a reverse shock that is supposed to tell the central region that the interstellar medium is being hit. Okay, so you have a shock propagating forward, a shock propagating backward, and in here you have a similar process, but now induced by the wind of electrons and positrons from the pulsar. So all these electrons and positrons are there, but they are trapped in this huge machine that is expanding at 10,000 kilometers per second. Now, of course, the question that may be uh, relevant here is how do I get those pairs out of there? Right? because we observe them at the Earth. So there will be adiabatic losses, radiative losses that kill them. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, all these pairs that are being accelerated in the, in the center, in the pulsar, represent a sort of cold wind that expands at the Lorentz factor of order 10 to 5, 10 to 6 or so. Okay? But eventually, they reach this place that I call termination shock here, which is the place where the wind of the pulsar is shocked again. And in fact, it's the reverse shock of the wind hitting the ejecta, okay? So it's the signal sent back from the ejecta towards the star. At this termination shock is where everything happens. You can actually take uh, Hubble images of a pulsar and see that in the center, in this region here, within the termination shock, there is no radiation whatsoever. The electron positron pairs are absolutely cold. And then they eventually get accelerated at the termination shock. And here you see all the radiation from the radio waves from the, uh, from the radio waves to gamma rays. Okay? So uh, termination shock is the place where these pairs are eventually accelerated. And they are accelerated for reasons that we don't fully understand with a pretty peculiar sort of uh, spectrum, which is relatively hard, e to minus 1, e to minus 1.5 up to a few hundred GeV, and then it steepens to e to minus 2.3, 2.4. Again, we don't understand in the details why this happens. Um, each model has its own complications. But the interesting thing that I wanted to point out is that most of these pulsars that are produced in the center, they are eventually supposed to leave the system at some point because they all are, uh, are, are born with a kick velocity. The distribution of kick velocity plotted here, and you see that the cumulative distribution, namely the probability of finding a pulsar with a kick velocity, say, um, 500 kilometers per second or so, is about 50%. So 
that means that if you just impose the equality between the position of the shock wave, or the forward shock wave, and the position uh, and the, the, the shock wave position and the position of the, of the pulsar moving in a ballistic motion, you find that typically 40,000, 50,000 years after the supernova explosion, the pulsar leaves the system. And at that point, it's absolutely free of releasing the uh, electrons and positrons that it generates even at that time. This is the energetic that is left in the pulsar rotation um, after the uh, pulsar escapes the system for the case of a dipole, magnetic dipole, or for other breaking index. And you see that the numbers are between 50% and a few percent, but they are way more than enough than is required to explain the positron excess. Now, these things are not speculative. We observe these pulsars that have left the system. These are just two cases. This is the famous uh, guitar nebula. And this is the mouse nebula. In both cases, the tracing back, at some point you find the supernova remnant where the pulsar uh, was to start with, okay? And this bubble of radiation that you see in the back is the result in either the radio or the X-rays, or both, uh, due to the radiation of the pairs, okay? So we actually observe that these things exist in nature. You can do a simple, well, not that simple, but sort of simple calculation of the uh, posturum fraction, which is due to these runaway pulsar wind nebula. And you can clearly see that both in shape and in terms of normalization, the data seem to be explained really well. In fact, it is sort of disappointing that people didn't think about this before the observation itself, because we have known for a long time that these pulsars uh, are perfect machines producing electrons and posturons. Now, I want to move to another topic in the list that I presented in the beginning, namely uh, anomalies in, uh, gamma ray, um, in gamma ray propagation. Now, we have plenty of observations, especially of AGN or different kind of blazers, different kind of uh, active galactic nuclei, especially blazers from cosmological distances. The reason why this is important is because the emission from these objects extends to multi-TV um, energies. And uh, the universe is opaque to gamma rays, which have energy larger than about 10 TV or so, because of pair production on the so-called EBL, the extragalactic background light. This is not cosmic microwave background. This is uh, infrared optical light, which is uh, produced by galaxies and eventually absorbed and re-emitted by dust. Uh, now, as you may imagine, while the CMB is well known within a part out of uh, 100,000 or so, this is not true for the EBL because you have to have models of galaxy evolution and, and so on. And especially it's not known as a function of redshift. So it is a bit tricky to calculate these absorption rates. Okay? Of course, you know very well the per production cross section, but you know very well the target. Now, however, you know a sort of a minimum EBL which is obtained by just taking all the galaxies and summing them together. So the EBL must be at least at that level, if not bigger. Okay, so nowadays the minimum is the solid line here, and the upper limits that are derived in the way that I will tell you in a second from TEV is up here. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is a plot of the energy it's a function of redshift where the opacity of the universe gets to one or three or two or five, okay? That means that the flux from that source is suppressed like e to minus that number, okay? So you don't expect to find events, say, uh, at opacity of order five or so, or at least the flux from those sources should be strongly suppressed like e to minus five or so, okay? Now the idea is basically that a photon produces uh, a photon leaving the source produces with a path length of about 80 megaparsec or so for a 10 TeV, uh, 10 TeV uh, photon, uh, produces a pair, okay, electron and positrons. And at that point, the flux gets suppressed because the electrons and positrons start losing energy through inverse Compton scattering, and they produce what is called an electromagnetic cascade. Now, these are several of these uh, um, objects at relatively, you know, cosmological distance. Largest is redshift 0 0.5, 0 0.6 or so. Okay, and these are spectra. And again, the curves uh, indicate the different levels of opacity. So this is tau equal 4, 3, 2, 
on one. So you see that there are several cases in which you see photons from individual sources in regions where the opacity is of order three or four. Now, uh, when I say that you see photons, uh, why is it surprising? Because when you try to take those observations and you correct for the opacity, you get spectra that don't make sense. That's the definition of anomaly, okay? That means, in other words, that you have a spectrum that is falling down like this, and you correct by the opacity, and you get that the intrinsic spectrum should be something weird like that, okay? And you say, okay, that doesn't make sense, so probably I'm correcting in a bad way the absorption, or probably there is something wrong with the physics I'm using. And of course, the physics is so simple that the problem must be basically either in the kinematics or most likely maybe in the EBL. Problem is that this anomaly presents itself already with the minimum EBL, namely just the one obtained by summing up all the galaxies. Okay, that is the reason why people got puzzled by this. Uh, of course, the explanations are, um, there may be different things that might be going on from exotic possibilities like tiny violations of Lorentz invariance, for instance. Tiny violation of Lorentz invariance uh, leads uh, to um, several effects. Uh, the first, uh, most straightforward, is that you change the threshold, the kinematic thresholds for pair production. Uh, Taking into account you are trying to drive in the dark here, right? So you don't know exactly where to go and you try to parameterize the, the possible forms of the Lorentz invariance violation that you might have in nature. But the amazing thing to me is that for uh, extremely small fluctuations at a scale much larger than the Planck scale, the threshold for pair production may even completely disappear. So even tiny violations of Lorentz invariance change the threshold for pair production in some of these models to the point of actually making the whole thing going, off, going away. So, this, from one point of view, might be seen as, oh my God, what are you talking about? Probably this is not what's happening. And I'm pretty sure that probably that's the case, but it's something to keep in mind. Or the other attitude is maybe I can put the limit again on these uh, violations uh, by saying that what I see is due to something else. Other possibilities have been advanced as well. Uh, in fact, one feature of these uh, anomalies in the gamma ray absorption is that Strangely enough, they depend on the line of sight. You know, you see one source in that direction, and it shows a cutoff that is fine, and then you, show, you, you take another source at the same redshift in another direction, and it shows an anomaly. So people have speculated that this might be due, for instance, to a, sort of a photon action oscillation. If uh, you have a, a, a scalar, a pseudo scalar with which the, the, the photon can couple in the presence of a magnetic field, you may have that part of its time, the photon spends as an axion. And the uh, intensity of the effect depends on the relative orientation between the magnetic field and the direction of motion of the, of the photon to start with. And so you might have uh, that in some line of sight, uh, you, the field, of course, doesn't keep an orientation. It has a random orientation. So the fluctuations on top of, uh, of the ordered field might give you different behaviors and different lines of sight. Okay. Again, one can use this, uh, these observations either to make a discovery claim or maybe just to put an upper limit. Now, unfortunately, again, we live in a complicated universe, so there are other things that one has to keep into account. Uh, gamma rays are produced uh, not only by the source itself, but they are produced by a bunch of other things uh, on the way, on route. For instance, if these powerful radio galaxies are also sources of ultra-energy cosmic rays, the ultra-energy cosmic rays pointing towards you, propagating on cosmological distances, will suffer photopion production. And photopion production generates now um, photons and leptons at the energy of order 10 to 19 electron volts or so. And that, as you may easily imagine, they generate electromagnetic cascades in turn, exactly the same way, although in a bit more complicated way because other backgrounds count as well. And you can find, for instance, that the region in the TV here, uh, 1 to 10 TV, is actually populated by the result of this electromagnetic cascade. So of course, if you try this exercise that I told you before, but these photons are not due to the source, but they have been produced next to you 
because of this electromagnetic cascade induced by hadrons, then your, your exercise is going to give you wrong results. So again, the universe is complicated. And when we try to use observations of this type to get new physics, we have always to keep in mind that these complications are there. A uh, similar idea is behind the recently discussed possibility of measuring the cosmological magnetic fields. And here we're talking about magnetic fields at the level of 10 to minus 17, 10 to minus 18 Gauss or so. And the idea is the following. Again, you have a gamma ray that is propagating through the EBL. And uh, when the threshold for pair production uh, is uh, overcome, then you generate a pair. So the threshold here is order 26 TV, for instance, for the EBL photon of uh, a, ten, a hundredth of an electron volts. Uh, the first few steps of the cascade proceed in the klein ishina regime. Then you fall into the Thompson regime, and the electrons and positrons just lose energy um, in a very slow way. Okay? At that point, you generate a cascade, and it can be shown very nicely. It was done by Berezinski and Smirnov in 1975. The spectrum is actually pretty universal. It's about e to minus 3 halves or so. Why is this important? Well, because we observe sources which have a spectrum harder than that. Uh, and this is uh, a qualitative uh, drawing that is supposed to clarify what I mean. So if you have a steep spectrum, and you generate this very hard cascading, it's going to be buried in the main signal here. But if the source spectrum is very hard, since energy is conserved in the cascading, of course, you're going to get a, a, a secondary flux, a cascading flux, which, thank you, the cascading flux, which is, in fact, uh, dominating over the spectrum of the primary. OK? Now, there is one uh, thing that uh, happens, however. Once you start producing electrons and positrons in the cascading, if there is an even tiny magnetic field, the electron and positron pairs are going to depart from the direction of motion. And uh, you can easily understand this, because Larmor radius in a field of 10 to minus 16 Gauss is about 10 megaparsec. And, uh, uh, the loss length for inverse Compton scattering in this regime is of the order of a half a megaparsec or so in the TeV. Now, this means that the deflection angle in one loss length of inverse Compton scattering is already of the order of two degrees. Why is that important? Because most of these observations in the TeV are done with the Cherenkov telescopes, which have an angular resolution which is less than that. And so if you lose photons from the direction of the source, you're going to say that the flux from that source is lower. So in other words, at low energy, you're going to lose photons. This is, for instance, a result of a calculation for uh, this is the spectrum of the primary. And you see what happens. All these photons are lost because of pair production. They are reprocessed at low energy. And uh, in principle, you should have this black solid line as a result of the cascading. So if this is observed by, say, Cherenkov telescope, Fermilat in this region should see a lot of gamma rays, and this sees none. And this has been used to derive an upper limit to the magnetic field, a lower limit, I'm sorry, to the magnetic field in the intergalactic medium at the level of about 10 to minus 17 Gauss, which is in a range of interest for a cosmological origin of, uh, of the magnetic field. It's the first time, as far as I know, that the lower limit on the field on cosmological distances is um, derived. Unfortunately, again, the universe is a bit complicated, so one has to go into the, uh, into the electro, uh, electromagnetic origin of the phenomena we are talking about. What are we talking about? So the photon, photons are now propagating like 1 over d squ distance squared from the source. And the path length of these photons for a 10 TeV energy is about 80 megaparsec. So the flux of electrons and positrons that you generated the first generation at the first pair production uh, interaction is of the order of 10 to minus 21, 10 to minus 22 per cubic centimeter. And you may say that this is a terribly small density. 
the cosmological density of baryons, omega baryon rho critical over mass of the proton is only 10, is, is 10 to minus 7. So it's 15 orders of magnitude larger. Yet, when you study this phenomenon from the electromagnetic point of view, you will see that this configuration with a beam of electrons and positrons with a density so fantastically smaller induces an extremely rapid instability on a scale which is the skin depth of the plasma. This develops on a scale of, uh, of time of about 20 seconds. And what happens is that the beam starts to broaden, okay? becomes puffier because of this plasma instability which is excited. Of course, the trick here is that, yes, you have a, a very few photons, but they are relativistic. The Lorentz factor of these things is about 10 to 6, 10 to 7, right? So uh, the role of, the, of these plasma-induced instabilities in, cosmology, in, uh, in astrophysical environments is extremely important. In fact, for people working in cosmic ray acceleration, this kind of instabilities is the very reason why we think that cosmic rays are accelerated in supernovae, for instance. In the, in the absence of this phenomenon, of this type of phenomena, you wouldn't have acceleration uh, probably up to energies larger than GV. And we observe energies which are six orders of magnitude larger. In the absence of these instabilities, none of the uh, high energy phenomena that we think we sort of understand in, uh, in the sources like supernova remnants would even take place. Now, this uh, uh, investigation has been done in, uh, in uh, quasi-linear theory first and then in a non-perturbative way. And what you can see is that there are different phases in this instability. The first part of the instability broadened the, the beam a little bit. And in fact, what it does is to uh, produce a delta P perp which is of the order of the mass of the electrons, so not, not that small, that, uh, not that large. That means that you have a 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7 opening of the beam, which still is okay from the point of view of gamma ray observations. However, after this phase, a viable instability can be excited, which is not electrostatic, it's electromagnetic instability. And this instability uh, has a relatively strong dependence on the exact distribution of the particles in phase space, but in principle can uh, uh, broaden the beam even more. So the question at that point becomes, when you put these limits on the magnetic field in the cosmological scale, are you really seeing the cosmological magnetic fields or whatever the beam produces itself? Because it doesn't like to, to propagate in a medium without magnetic field because of the generation of these instabilities. So again, uh, it's, all of these are extremely interesting possibilities to derive either new physics or to constrain things that we hadn't uh, have a chance of limit before, but one has always to keep in mind that uh, the universe is a complicated place. So, as I said in the beginning, it, is, uh, it has been true, and in principle it can still be true that we can search for new physics in cosmic rays, maybe with a note of pessimism we might even be forced to do so <laughs> in the future. Uh, but the universe is a complicated place, and in order to spot new physics, we have to really achieve a good or excellent understanding of all the uh, background manifestations of non-thermal phenomena. Anomalies in cosmic rays actually abound. There are many more than I had the time to talk about. Uh, some are more anomalous than others, let's say, because uh, they have, most of them have, have more mundane explanations. And the posture nexus is probably a, um, a good example, a good example to, uh, on one side, explain how astrophysical uh, explanations can actually uh, can actually justify what we see. On the other hand, from the sociological point of view, it was a pretty interesting phenomenon to observe because many people were forcing the models to levels that wouldn't otherwise have done. Uh, uh, I didn't have time to talk about some other interesting things that are going on. For instance, dark matter could in, princi in principle be much heavier. This actually was something that was studied until 10, 15 years ago when uh, there were many more anomalies in ultra-energy cosmic rays. So uh, dark matter mass of the order of the inflaton mass, for instance. Uh, more recently, there have been indications of uh, gamma ray lines in cosmic rays. There have been indications of uh, 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 spatially extended access in the GEV 
from the center of the galaxy. I would say that all of these are at the present uh, circumstantial evidence and uh, some of them sort of dubious in the sense that, for instance, the gamma ray lines seem to correlate with, the, uh, uh, seem to appear when the experiment looks down at the atmosphere of the Earth. So there are things that, you know, one has to keep in, in mind, not only because the universe is complicated, but also because the instruments we use are complicated. So I'll finish here. How many supernova have we directly observed? And uh, what we uh, observed, uh, what we really observed. You mean supernovae or supernova remnants? Supernova. Supernovae. Uh, 1987, for instance, one supernova. Well, we observe uh, hundreds of them on cosmological scales. That actually used for. Directly, I mean directly. Directly, I mean we see. You uh, see a flash of light. We see the spectra, we see the, we are able to say something about composition of the stuff that is injected and so on, yes. Uh, the composition is uh, a theory, okay? But no, I mean you observe spectra from these objects. Okay, the spectrum. You observe the spectrum of light. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that, uh, and some sort of flash of, it's a naive question, I'm not an expert. No, no, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, um, you observe uh, just, uh, I don't know, a few seconds of a light, a flash of... Uh... Well, we, we have an all zoo of things, okay? So most of the supernovae that we observe are cosmological supernovae. When, uh, when we are, by supernovae we mean the explosion of the supernova. Yes, but the explosion yeah. of supernova is... Uh, um, what is the observation? The, the rest, the neutron star you observe, or you observe a flash of light? Uh, for the explosion yeah, itself, here. for the explosion itself, you observe a flash of light because these objects are cosmological, right? how many right? you have observed um, since 1987? Uh, hundreds, in hundreds, fact, you know, okay. you see that. So you uh, observe hundreds of flash of light. Yeah. Okay, you observe the spectrum of this uh, light, okay? I'm like the light curve, yeah. And uh, not just a flash, it may last days or months or... It's not a, fr uh, it's not a flash of seven. It's no, I mean the supernova the explodes and then eventually you have the expanding shell, so you keep seeing radiation, the, the light eventually becomes dimmer and dimmer, and actually studying the time, the light curve, you are able to say whether the supernova so is of time, some type or another view, one. Everything is well understood. This is a different question. <laughs> well, you asked me what we see. I'm asking. I'm okay, asking. that's what we see. But uh, the point, everything, the, the, I don't know what it means. I mean, for instance, so when okay, cosmic, ray, cosmic, rays, cosmic rays that, for instance, I was referring to are not accelerated during these uh, bursts that you are referring to. They are accelerated in historical supernova remnants, a supernova that expands over times of a thousand years. Now, we see many of them in the galaxy. I'm, I don't think I have, well, I don't have it uh, in this presentation, but I can show you uh, in a different presentation. And uh, we see, of course, many of them, beautiful pictures from the radio to the uh, X-rays to the gamma rays and so on. So it's, I don't think we have a, a shortage of uh, observations or beautiful images of them. What we uh, have a hard time understanding, of course, I'm trying to see what a good one is. Let, uh, me, let me do the question in this, in this way. Yeah. As far as I know, even the magnetic field of the Earth is not very, understood, very well understood, isn't it? Oh. Why we observe a magnetic field, the origin of the magnetic field in the Earth? Is well understood? Do we have measurement, precise measurement? I don't see the connection between the, galactic, the magnetic field no, of the uh, Earth and, and is, uh, supernovae. I don't, I'm sorry. What, is, what does that mean? I don't understand the question, really. If you're trying to say that there are things we don't understand, that's true. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay, mine is not a question on, on, on your 
talk, but I heard that there is also some anomaly in some uh, PV neutrinos observed at, uh, in Ice Cube, and I wonder if you Well, have I wouldn't call it an anomaly. I would call it a discovery. I mean, in the sense that, uh, that the anomaly, so these are, for instance, all supernova remnants that uh, we observe. All of, each one of those things is a supernova remnant. So uh, yes, uh, Ice Cube, for the first time after a long waiting, uh, has seen evidence for um, neutrinos which are not of terrestrial origin. So they are not associated with interaction of cosmic rays in the atmosphere. Um, they have a very hard spectrum, roughly e to minus two. They, the spectrum extends to about uh, a PV uh, or so. Uh, the spatial distribution in the sky does not look like correlating with the galaxy itself, at least not statistically. There seems to be, if you just look at the picture of the sky, there seems to be a, a sort of an axis in the direction of the bulge of our own galaxy, but statistically speaking, it's not significant at all. So uh, if you look at the points in the sky, they are roughly uh, isotropic. So um, probably these are of uh, extragalactic um, uh, origin. There are several things that are being evaluated as possible sources. Of course, people have been developing models for these neutrinos of extragalactic origin for 30 years or so. So now we have the first ever data on this. So we need to understand what is the most uh, reasonable Apparently, source. Could have something to do with this uh, photons that you were mentioning. Right, so one possibility, but I don't think it, uh, yes, one possibility, one, possi one possibility is that ultra-energy cosmic rays, while propagating, the photo they are subject to photopion production and beta Hitler production. So you generate electron-positron pairs in the second process, you generate pions in the first uh, process, and uh, eventually uh, uh, neutral pions will decay into gamma rays, and these are lost. I mean, these gamma rays will develop an electromagnetic cascade, and you will see these photons in the TV. The charged pions will give you uh, neutrinos, and uh, eventually the decay of the neutrons will also give you uh, neutrinos, and actually the two peaks are in the range between 10 to 15, 10 to 16 electron volts or so. The fluxes don't seem to be right, in the sense that they seem to be um, too, uh, too high to be those, those neutrinos. So the question there is open. So question about uh, no, your model uh, in which uh, secondary po positrons uh, are produced, uh, are accelerated inside supernovae. So it also predicts uh, secondaries. Uh, so what is now the status with the data? Thank you. I didn't have time to cover that, but um, let's see if I can find my talk here. Uh, yes, you are absolutely right. So that uh, maybe I should say some words about um, what you're talking about because I didn't mention that possibility. Uh, but the idea is that um, positrons accelerated inside sources may be uh, themselves accelerated at the shock of a supernova. And uh, that's a model I put forward in 2009. And as you correctly pointed out, there is also an associated signal in the antiprotons, uh, which is still okay with the Pamela data. The, most of the problem comes, if any, from boron over carbon and uh, titanium over iron uh, spectra. So the model predicts that all of these things should rise up at uh, about 100 GeV per nuclear or so. so it's difficult to say. The titanium over iron seems to be going up in uh, some data sets. The boron over carbon seems to be not going up. So uh, I would say at the present it's a bit confusing. It, uh, probably the AMS2 should shed some light on this, but the data that they put forward are still unofficial and preliminary, so I, I'm not, uh, I don't know what to do with them yet. But so far, it is true that there might be a problem with the secondary to primary ratios. I think we can stop here. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah.